Good evening to everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. Khotep. Did you have a your worship? Take his name. Or And um, I'm really very pleased today to have this very outstanding speaker over here, Solomon Comission, originally from Trinidad. And in addition to the four books he has published, he is on radio, he is a person who has his own independent radio program, it's called Your World News, and he is a co-host, uh, we have his co-host also here, uh, Tim Ballard of Ancient, please if you could stand up for a minute. And, um, and he speaks against police brutality, he speaks for, for social justice, so it's a great team, and coming from the University of Maryland, you know, we know it's a very big university, but Lincoln University has a very big heart. Mm. And this university, you know, as our uh, SDA president was saying, is sacred ground. Right. People <coughs> of great spiritual stature, people who have been giants in African American history, and those who have stood up for the rights of our people, they have studied here, they have graduated from here. We have connections with Africa, so this is a place where people like Commission should be coming and speaking, so I thought it was exactly the right connection. So with these few words, I'd like to welcome Solomon. If I could pause the question. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Do a little bit better than that. Good evening. Good evening. All right, yeah, this is going to be a hip-hop oriented. I'm going to be using hip-hop as a point of departure to uh, deconstruct a lot of different issues to get into some things that maybe some of us, uh, myself included, you know, have been programmed to, to take for granted um, on a daily basis. And, and taking certain things for granted often plays a, a major role that benefits other folks who profit and exploit our communities day in and day out, week in and week out, year after year, decade after decade, generation after generation. So we're going to get into the often untold um, history of hip-hop, but it's almost kind of like a misnomer because we're going to get into so much more. We have a lot of ground to, to, to make up. And, but first and foremost, I would like to thank uh, you, the student body, for, for allowing me to be here. I want to thank Professor Siddiqui, who has worked tirelessly to, uh, in communication with me to, to bring me here um, in concert with um, the student body president, student uh, body vice president. And I know many of you in this room also have played a, a role in, in allowing me to be here. And I say allowing me to be here because this is sacred ground. One of my heroes, Asajid Fo, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, um, graced this campus. You know, and was graced by this campus. And, um, you know, he's known as, as one of the, one of the uh, founding fathers of Pan-Africanism. And somebody who's, uh, whose words and, and work, most importantly his work, have played a major role in developing who I am as not just a professional, but as a human being, as an activist, and, and so forth. So uh, and I give all praise due to the ancestors who, who brought us all here today. So with that being said, let's, let's get this thing underway. I want to start off the first, first slide. I want to pay homage, as I said, to the ancestors. And one of the ancestors that we have right here on the board, um, I have is the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey. And I'm sure all of you are familiar in some shape, form, or fashion who Marcus, Marcus Messiah Garvey was you know, the founder of the Universal Negro Improvement Association, UNIA. Um, you know, I, I mean, I could you know, teach an entire 15-week course on, on what Marcus Messiah Garvey did and what he's meant to the struggle for African people um, the world over. Um, and he said, people without knowledge of their history, this is one of the more famous quotes by him, people without knowledge of their, of their uh, history is like a tree without roots. That's just kind of like a little snapshot of that of that quote, that famous quote from him. And so I learned about Marcus Messiah Garvey, not from America's public educational school system. I didn't, not in any shape, form, or fashion. Matter of fact, if I left it to America's public educational system to teach me about Marcus Garvey, I would have never learned about Marcus Garvey. I learned about him in 1989, listening to a song um, by a, a rapper by the name of uh, Intelligent Hoodlum. And this is a quote from that song. Blessed with the talents and format of kicking the earth like a doormat. The more I grow, the more I understand. And I don't really care about a grafted man because he wants to mold, shape, and carve me. But I use my mind like Marcus Garvey. So just being an inquisitive young person, just like they are today. But unfortunately, 
a lot of young people are exposed to a different brand of, of hip hop. I call it corporate hip hop that has vastly different messages and images. But just as inquisitive as they are today, which might precipitate a young person today to, you know, for the first time to hear the term Cristal or to hear some other terms that perhaps they, they should not know about, it, especially at, at that juncture being 13, 14 years of age, not even old enough to drink. I was precipitated to, to find out who, who, who was this guy, who was this? I, di I didn't know if he was referencing another rapper. I had no idea. Who was this guy, Marcus Garvey? I used my man like Marcus Garvey. So when I looked it up and I found out who Marcus Garvey was, matter of fact, I asked my mom first, and she was like, you learned that in school? I was like, no, no. You know, I learned it in, in a rap song. You know, back, back then, you know, you know, we, we, and we'll get into it, we referred to the music as rap, you know what I'm saying, more so than just saying like hip hop. All right, because unfortunately, if you just use the word hip hop to associate it with the music, you're kind of limiting hip hop because hip hop is a culture and rap is something within that culture. But that's how I, I found out who Marcus Garvey was. And that's how, most importantly, his work influenced what I was setting myself out to do as a young person and well beyond. So I just want to just really, just quickly, just ask some of you one word or two word responses or more. You don't have to truncate it or limit it to, to one or two words. But what does hip hop mean to you? What does it mean to you? Art. Huh? Art. Good, good answer. Art. What else? Culture. All right. Message music. What else? Expression. Expression. Okay. You're, you're all. You're all right on. I, I couldn't agree with you more. That that definitely covers much of what hip hop is. This is what hip hop means to me. It means resistance. It means culture, as, as some, somebody said. It means uh, expression. It means beats, innovation, fellowship, activism. I learned, you know, that's the first time I got the itch to become a social activist. So all those things that, that I, was, I was warmly introduced as, one of the most important things that I would like to identify myself as is a social activist. Somebody that spends time, boots on the ground, in the community, um, week in and week out, going into the, into the surrounding communities and where I, where I live, and that's Washington, D.C., that's Georgia County, doing everything that I can to give back to those communities and making sure, as, as an independent journalist, making sure I bring the issues, as we know, especially those of us that are, that are black and brown in this room, the issues of our communities are oftentimes, seldom, ever, if ever, and we're going to get into that, we're going to get deep into that, are ever portrayed accurately or even period, you know, on the corporate media airwaves. We know police brutality is a major issue in black and brown communities. I'm going to throw something out at you. Last year there was a report, an extensive report that was done by the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, an organization that I have the utmost respect for. And this report found out that every 36 hours, at least every 36 hours, a black person in the United States of America is killed, murdered by the police that is killed without trial, that is killed, and within that report, I've read the entire report, the vast majority of those people were completely unarmed. And some of those people that were quote unquote armed, they were armed with things like walking, like a, a cane, walking canes, all right? This is something that should have been on the cover of time if we lived in a just society, a, a society that is based on social justice, and I'm, yes, I'm putting it out there, I'm gonna say the United States of America has a long way to go to being a country that is based and predicated with, that values social justice in any shape, form, or fashion. So I learned about all those things. And so to go on, I just want to cover some important things because if we're going to get into hip hop, let's, let's talk about the real. And so hip hop is not a musical genre. It is the, the founding principles of hip hop are peace, love, unity, and having fun. Yeah, how, when's the last time Viacom? When I say Viacom, let's get to the heart of it. I like, I like to expose the perpetrators for themselves. Let's not hide Viacom behind BET or MTV or VH1. Viacom owns BET, uh, uh, BET VH1, uh, MTV 1, 2, and 3, and however they have, many they have. It also, you know, Viacom also has uh, ownership in many, many, many radio stations throughout the country. They used to, have, um, you know, I think they still do own uh, 95.5, which is the uh, one of the, the the predominant hip hop stations in Washington, D.C. And so, Viacom, they, they don't talk about this. They, they don't talk about peace, love, unity, having fun. They, they don't, they don't. And I, and I put it out there, I'm gonna, as we go on, I just wanna put it out there. I am not a big fan of censorship. 
but I am going to let you know. So if anyone wants to try to, hey, because sometimes when I come into this, you know, when I, when I do these talks, I don't think that we're dealing with this crowd right here, but sometimes we get this inertia, this resistance. Folks like, beat the chest. Ooh, how are you coming on BET? What are, what are you talking about censorship? Well, BET and those and, and the like, and it's not just BET, you can talk about Player Channel, which is the largest radio corporation in the U.S. They censor music from ever hitting your eardrums every single day. As we speak right now, they're censoring. So it'd be one thing if you're playing this, you're playing Trinidad, James, Gold, everything, you know, where it's just interesting. And, and it just shows the, the amount of, of mockery and how we have been dumbed down. I mean, you see how this rapper who's through his video, beyond the, the lyrics, just the imagery, he's wearing a Confederate hat in different portions in the video. And like, you know what I'm saying, and, and we accept it. But, but, so you have that, iner that, that inertia. But listen to this. BET is suppressing. So as long as they play these images, they are suppressing the dead presence. They are playing, they are suppressing immortal techniques, the Gene Grays, the Invincibles. I mean, I can go on and on, on and on. Because the vast majority of hip hop music, of rap music, rap is rhythm and poetry. That's what rap stands for. The vast majority of rap music that comes from the U.S. is never played on mainstream corporate airwaves. And much of that music that is being suppressed has to do with some powerful political uh, narratives throughout it. It has to do with history. It has to, it has to do with a range of things. So we'll get into that. But rap, I mean, hip-hop culture is b-boying, which otherwise known as breakdancing, DJing, rapping, graffiti, beatboxing. Here's a big one. Here's a very important one. Knowledge of self, knowledge of community. Yeah, that's one of, that's one of the core founding principles of hip-hop culture. Urban jargon, entrepreneurialism, and urban fashion. Hip-hop has basically, I've broken down to three different stages and evolutions. Um, you know, some hip-hop historians may have it slightly different. I have it, you know, the early 70s, the beginnings, uh, which, you know, uh, became an outlet for urban youth to express themselves. You guys mentioned uh, expression, freedom of expression. These, we're talking about very, very indigent communities in abject poverty. I'm not going to call them ghettos. I'm going to call them governmentally neglected communities in the South Bronx that these communities where these individuals, you know, uh, these young people, you know, their, their, their school systems, you know, were, were cutting back on sports programs and art programs. And this became an outlet for them to, to in a lot of ways, to, to resist, to let the city know I am here, I, am exi I, I exist, to talk about, to speak out with not just music but graffiti art, um, uh, social narratives and, and things that, and social issues that were going on, like police brutality. And really, graffiti art started like what we now know as contemporary, modern graffiti art started in the late 60s in Philadelphia. And we're going to, but it's all connected back to ancient Africa, otherwise known as al Land, which is the original name of Africa. The Conscious Era, 1986, 1994, heightened consciousness of rap music. It, and this is my era right here, increased youth activism. Yes, it was the music that directly helped light a fire in me to actually get out in the community and actually want to be involved in solutions as a young person, 12, 13, 14, 15 years of age and on. And now we have the corporate back explosion, 1996, um, 1995 slash 1996. We'll get into that. And that's, that's where we're in the midst right now. We're still in the corporate back explosion. Hip hop starts, you, you can, I mean, you, I mean, we can go back generations, we can go back centuries if we want to like make those correlations to ancient African history, and we will. But we'll look at 1940s, Jamaica. Jamaica, out comes from, from out of Jamaica comes these, the big sound system, the dance halls, these huge speakers, six foot tall speakers, right? And this is brought from Jamaica with, uh, uh, this is brought from Jamaica by the founding father of hip hop, which is DJ Kool Herc. And he brings that to New York in the 60s when he comes to, to New York City. But the Cross Bronx Expressway, which was a major thoroughfare that was created, um, that, that basically, you know, established, you know, what we now call, you know, white flight. So a lot of white people moved out of, uh, out of uh, different areas of the Bronx because of the construction. It was just troublesome. It was just, you know, um, you know it, it was just a, an eyesore to them. So they, they, they left. Uh, it devastated a lot of uh, communities of color that, that were there. That were there. Um, you're talking about major, major construction going on for years and years and years, done by, the guy, by a guy by the name of Robert Moses. We look at 1962, 
Um, James Brown, Live at the Apollo, which I would say is, is an example of one, uh, one of the first break beats where he just kind of lets his percussionist, Clayton Philly, out his drummer just go off. We would just let, just let his drummer go. And I say that because that inspired a lot of early DJs, looking back, because some of those early DJs you know, were told this story, were exposed to this, this uh, record, they were told this story by the, their parents, and that kind of ins inspired a lot of them. Even though, you know, um, we'll get into some, a little bit more on the, on the breakbeat, but I like to say that that was a, a form of one of the first breakbeats. So we said we're going to go back to Africa, right? Hieroglyphics. You heard of hieroglyphics. Mm -hmm. The original name of hieroglyphics <clears throat> is Metonetum, Word of the Gods. This is the original, the original so-called Egyptians, the original commands. Because Egypt, as we know, Egypt was a name that was given to that part of the world, that country in Africa, in North Africa, by the Greeks. And the Greeks came in, but the original Egyptians were, called themselves Kemetans. They were Kemetans, all right? Kemet. And they called it Metronetra. They called what we call, what we've been taught to, to call hieroglyphics, they called it Metronetra, which is the word of the gods, all right? And hieroglyphics, um, you know, just like, for instance, the word Egypt is land of the blacks or, or city of the blacks, and that's what the Egyptians called. The, the original Egyptians looked much like many of us in this room. Very, very dark, to perhaps maybe as light as myself. So this whole, when you watch, like, for instance, the mythology that they have on TV, when you have, like, uh, you know, uh, Night at the Museum, have you ever seen that movie? With uh, many, many movies where you see like a pale-faced person playing like a, uh, an Egyptian pharaoh. That's mythology, pure mythology. It's been pure proven, carbon testing. We know that they had very, very dark skin because they followed the Nile River, which goes from south to north, and they came up from Nubia, what is now known as much, much of Nubia is known as, as Sudan. As a matter of fact, Nubia, Sudan, has a times as many pyramids as does Egypt. Yeah. Graffiti influence. We talked about that. Started by a cat by the name of uh, uh, Cornbread and, and, uh, and Cool Earl. All right, mainly Cornbread. It's known as kind of like the father of hip-hop graffiti. 1965, 66, 67. Cool Herc, as I said before, migrates from Jamaica to, the, to uh, New York. And I have the Savage Seven, the Black Spades, Black Cats. I have that there because the godfather, not to be confused with the father, the godfather of hip hop is DJ African Mambada. African Mambada was a former gang member, all right? And when he made a trip, he made a trip to South Africa which is where he changed his name. He got his name after Bambada. He comes back and says, you know, and it totally changes his life. And he decides, you know what, I'm going to use hip hop as a tool to quell gang violence in the city of New York. From the grill to the MC. I'm sure many of you already know that the grill is an ancient African storyteller. And so that's why you have a lot of, 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 of different hip hop crews or, or or hip hop artists referring to themselves as, as the underground griots or, or MC griot, this, that, and the other. They're paying homage because they would often use these ancient African storytellers would use poetic license. They would be the ones that would stand on a, on a tree stump or, or, um, or a rock. And if, if I had, if my, my family or I had a squad with Tim who's behind the camera, that griot would get on that tree stump or on that rock and would tell the story each person's story, and you as a community, because you understand, you've heard this term, it takes a village. It didn't just take a village to raise a child. The village was involved in community issues, not just raising the children, which is a, an important community issue, but also settling different disputes and differences and so forth. That's what the, that's what the griot did. And they were like kind of like the town crier, but they also carried down information, historical information from one generation to the next generation. Vastly important. Black counterculture, we move all the way, we move to um, the 60s, the 70s, and we look at the likes, for instance, of, of the last poets, you guys have heard of the last poets, I'm sure, Gil Scott Heron, they use poetic license, you've heard of the, the revolution will not be televised by 
Gil Scott Heron, maybe Whitey on the Moon, so many different, you know, important pieces of work that he put out there. But they were, they, they were, they were, they were rappers in their own way. They were, they were using poetic license to tell stories. As a matter of fact, this self-entitled album, The Last Post, When it hit Europe, a lot of Europeans had no idea how bad racism was in the U.S. still at that time. So when it got there, when they started listening, it exposed them. They had no idea. They're like, yo, we had no idea that this was still going down in the U.S. So don't ever underestimate the power of music within a revolution. Music is important. You think about all the different uh, insurrections of, uh, of enslaved Africans. Like, for instance, the Stono Rebellion in South Carolina where they were beating the drums, okay? So we'll, and we'll get a little bit more into the drums right here. We will look at hand bone to beatboxing. Beatboxing is, is, is a part of hip hop. It's the ability to make music out of your mouth, sometimes your chest. But with enslaved Africans, I, I, I want to emphasize this. When you just refer to them as slaves, you take away their identity. You take away their identity. They were enslaved Africans. They were kidnapped from Africa, brought to the Western Hemisphere, because it wasn't just the U.S., it was all over. It was Mexico, all throughout South America, throughout the Caribbean, where I'm originally from. And so one of the things that, that you have to do when you want to domesticate somebody, see, it's not just important. If you, want, if you want to enslave somebody for generations, you can't just tie them up. You can't just tie them up and tie whole masses and swaths of them up for year after year after year and expect, to, expect to, to be able to enslave them properly because they're going to resist. So what do you have to do? You have to take away their culture. You have, they had to literally try to domesticate African people, our ancestors, like dogs. Like dogs, domesticated, take their minds away. So you've heard about that Harriet Tubman, one, one of my favorite quotes of all time. She says, I freed a thousand slaves. I could have freed a thousand more if they knew they were slaves. I could have freed a thousand more if they knew they were slaves. And some of us still, maybe not in this room, but some of us still have shackles in our minds. All right, and are trying, and, and are trying, or in some cases not trying hard enough to break these mental shackles. But to break away. To break away from the taking away of the drums, which is a major aspect to this day. It's also, I don't know if you know, drums is, a, is, is something that Africans also use to connect to, to the spirits, to the ancestors. And to, so they say, okay, you took, you took the drums away. And so what they would do is the men would start to beat their chest and to make sounds with their chest. And the women and other men would sing along. Think about this. That, that is resistance in and of itself. That is powerful. Powerful. So when you see something like beatboxing, it doesn't come out of nowhere. This is something that has been passed down from the ancestors. This is spiritual intervention that has been passed down by the ancestors. Beatboxing. The ability of these inner city um, youth from, from these very, very poor communities saying, you know what, no, we don't have the economic wherewithal to buy this machine and that machine and this piece of technology. Hey, we're going to make beats with our mouths. We're going to make beats with our mouths. We're going to make create cadences, and he's going to rap to it, or she's going to rap to it, or she's going to make that beat. And also, I just want to know, you can connect Hambone, obviously, to something that, that you guys are very familiar with, and that is, that is step, step in and strolling, okay? So, you, 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 you know, if your parents or maybe your grandparents will tell you about Hambone, Hambone, have you heard, Mama's going to buy you a Mockingbird, you know, what, you know they're very... Uh, very like famous, you know, handbone oriented song. All right, but it involved doing things like this, and sometimes using you know wooden spoons and so forth to make. And this this is a direct correlation to beatboxing. But before that, stepping, stepping comes from that. 1973. This is the this is what's known as like the start, the the tipping point of uh, the the point of departure for hip hop culture as we know it. And that guy that I, I, spent, I mentioned before, the father of hip-hop, DJ Cool Herc, he throws a party in August of seven, 1973, 1973 for his, uh, uh, his sister, 
and he brings um, Coca Rock and, and, and um, um, Clark Kent, two local rappers, to the party. And it has them, and it, it was very basic rhymes, very basic rhymes, so you might walk into, walk into the, um, to the house party. What's your name, sister? Me? Yeah. Winnie. Winnie. So uh, Winnie might walk into the party and say, hey, um, and, and he might toast, give a shout out to Winnie. Say, hey, Winnie's in the house. Can everybody, everybody on this side say, hey, everyone say ho. Like just basic, basic <laughs> raps like that. But what this guy did, cool her, he started, he elongated a breakbeat. In a, in a record. He elongated the breakbeat in a record so that they had something to rhyme over. So it takes that instrumental part, elongates it so they have something to go. So it's not just, you know, it's not just kind of like an acapella, but it has this beat that goes to it. Zulu Nation, 1973. I told you about Africa Bambada. He is the one that created the founding principles of hip hop peace, love, unity, and having fun. He had the first rap, um, uh, uh, rap show uh, or, uh, where they played rap music on WHBI in New York City. And at the end of his show, he said, hip hop culture is peace, love, unity, and, and having fun, fun. And it would echo the fun, fun, fun. <coughs> All right, so that's what it is. Peace, love, unity, having fun. Not senseless violence, misogyny, sexism, you know, um, uh, misogyny sex, uh, directed against, you know, uh, black and brown women. No, no, that's not that's not the founding principles of hip hop. It's peace, love, unity, and having fun. And so, as, as they say, as, as the great Carl G. Woodson said in *Miseducation of Negro*. A very, very important book if you've never read it, because I would say it's perhaps just as apropos today to read that book and to sink into that book, especially those of you that go to HBCUs. To, to, to delve into that book. It's not a long book to read The Miseducation of the Negro, but he gets into that, he breaks down the culture of, of thinking or lack thereof, that when you control a man's thinking, you can make him do anything you want them to do. So if you tell somebody, just as you've seen, I'm sure you've seen uh, uh, Roots, where he said, you know, kept whipping him. What's your name? What's your name? What's your name? He wants to break them down. He wanted to break him down and change his name to Toby. And as we know, most of us in this room carry the, 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 the anchors of our ancestor slave masters with us. If your last name is Williams or Smith or O'Neill <laughs> or Donalds or this, that, and the other, there was no Africans running around, you know what I'm saying? No, these, these were the names that were, that were given. As I said, it was like domestication as you, you get a, a puppy from, the, from the, the, the pet store and we're going to call that puppy such and such. That's exactly what happened. That's exactly, exactly what happened. I, I know it may be a shock, but it's the, it's the truth. I'm just, I'm just telling you the truth. And so what he said, you control a man's thinking, you can make them do anything they want. So if you tell them that this is hip hop, you tell them this is hip hop, that it's sexism, misogyny, just give it to them in large doses. Give it to them on their college radio stations, on their local radio stations, put it on the corporate airways, and at the same time, suppress some of the most revolutionary, empowering stuff empowering stuff, you can get them to believe that this is what hip-hop is, and some of them will be aspiring hip-hop artists themselves, will be aspiring uh, producers or a &R folks, and they'll go around promoting, looking for artists that sound exactly like that mentally deleterious stuff that's been fed to you, fed to us day in and day out, over and over and over and over and over again. DJ Love Bark Starsky, you've heard Biggie's album, you hear the song Juicy, you've heard Ready to Die, he said, DJ Love Bug Star Ski. <laughs> DJ Love Bug Star Ski coined the phrase hip hop, but Africa Bimbada gets credit for it because he popularized the term hip hop. Park jams start to become more frequent. DJ Grand Wizard Theodore, The Scratch, um, which is something that when I was growing up, most MCs, most rap groups, whether it was Gangstar, you know, whether it was um, BDP, whether it was Poor Righteous Teachers, the DJ was as prominently featured as were the MCs. And so in the middle of the song, the DJ would just start cut, cutting it up. All right, but that scratching, that, that style comes from, from this guy. And it was kind of fortuitous because his mom didn't like the fact that he was playing the music a little bit too loud and was yelling and he took his hand off, off his, uh, his headphone and you know, put his hand on, the, on his other hand on the needle. 
and it scratched the record and made that sugar sugar sound, but he liked it. So when she was done yelling at him, he went back and started and started to try to manipulate that. So he 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 stumbled across it, but then you had artists like Grandmaster Flash who kind of really um, really developed the needle drop and really took scratch into a whole nother level. Mercedes ladies, the B-boy and Mercedes ladies, they paved the, the way for uh, uh, female groups like, all women groups like uh, Salt and Pepper. Um, you look at uh, break dancing, B-boying, B-girling, Rocksteady Crew, Electric Boogaloos were on the West Coast, Rocksteady Crew in New York City. Those are just two of the many I could name. Um, and it was, you know, the Electric Boogaloos, for instance, 1978, they were on Soul Train, they, and they influenced the young Michael Jackson. You may not know this, but a lot of Michael Jackson's videos, like Thriller, Beat It, some of the background dancers, all right, they were, they were break dancers. They were b-boys and b-girls. They were brought in by the choreographer to be a part of that, that video. Sylvia Robinson, you can't talk about hip-hop without paying homage to women. Women have played an enormous, enormous, enormous role in hip-hop. So this, this, this woman right here, she was producer extraordinaire. She owned her own record label, Sugar Hill Records. Her name was Sylvia Robinson. She's um, responsible for the Sugar Hill Gang. And if it wasn't for her, we may not have that classic song in 1979, the, the first main, the first hip hop song to make it to, to mainstream America, so-called mainstream America, Rapper's Delight, which is still a timeless song. Um, and uh, she's also responsible for, for instance, the message, the first uh, uh, really thought-provoking, conscious, like socially conscious rap song to make it to the mainstream, and that's in 1982, The Message, by uh, um, Melly Mel and, um, and Duke Booty, all right? So, you know, people often say, we'll say Grandmaster Flash, but it was Melly Mel and Duke Booty that were really like the, the primary MCs within that song in that video. And you can look it up, it's timeless. So that's Sylvia Robinson. Hip-hop starts to get mainstream exposure, 1980, Funky 4 Plus 1, 19, uh, 1981, we see Barbara Walters in 2020 um, going to New York City. They're fascinated, like, oh, what is this? Gonna, you know, this break the, and, 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 uh, and she was uh, following uh, African Bambada throughout the city. It was, you know, it was, it was on a feature story on 2020. Flashdance movie, uh, break dances were, were featured in that movie in Central Park. Uh, Wild Style was a movie about hip hop. I mean, we can go on and on and on. So, but hip hop starts to get this mainstream exposure. 1984, we start to see movies starting to come about. Crush Group, Break In, Dis Disorderlies, uh, B Street. Um, yeah, Disorderlies, I, I liked the movie when I was young. Yeah, I look back at it, it's a, yeah, it's a terrible movie. But, but um, <laughs> hip hop starts to, starts to get that, that, you know, starts to get this mainstream mo exposure, for better or for worse. For better or for worse, depending on what way you look at it. Um, and and at, in general, most of, of America, beside youth, stop. Stop, thought rap was a passing fad. Thought, it, thought this thing, rap and hip hop in general, was a passing fad. This is going to go fly by the night. Elders used to say rap is crap. They used to say it all the rap is crap. This is not going to last. They used to say it all the time. And I, and I almost wish that it, it stayed that way because when we, when we move forward and we see when these corporations, mostly white corporations, start to get their hands on hip hop to see how it changed. The conscious era, the golden era. The era of consciousness, if you will, otherwise known as the golden era of hip hop. This is what developed my mind as a young person. You know, this is what developed my mind. All right, great. I was listening to songs like uh, Public Enemy, uh, Public Enemy's Black Steel, um, in the Hour of Chaos. You know, from a, a, a really important, there's similar work. Uh, Takes a nation of millions to hold us back. Eric B and Rakim. Uh, we, we talk about Boogie Down Productions and KRS-One. This is where you start to have these artists that are really start to use hip hop and rap music as a tool, as a tool to start to flesh out and to talk about issues that are going on in their city. And as we know, Chuck D and, and, and even uh, Jam S J, they used to say that, yo, this hip hop, this is like our CNN. Because CNN ain't talking about our, 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 what's going on in the hood. They're not talking about the, 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 the mass poverty. They're not talking about how it impacts us. They're not talking about our schools. They're not talking about police brutality. They're sure as hell not talking about police brutality. So we're going to talk about it. And so I was listening to uh, Black Steel and the Hour of Chaos on the way up here. And I was telling Tim, I was like, yo, when I first heard this song, and there's a part, 
And then the song, you know, I got a letter from the government the other day. I opened the Reddit. It said they were suckers. They wanted me for the army or whatever. Picture me giving a damn. I said, never. Here is a land that never gave a damn about a brother like me and myself. And then he goes on, you know, and he goes on to saying, um, I, and, a, and a black man can never be a veteran. He goes on to saying that. And he becomes, the whole song is about, he becomes a political prison, prisoner because he, it, you know, uh, objects from, from, from answering that letter and going into the military. And it's a powerful song. It talks about prison issues, talks about political issues. It's a very, very important. You can get it on YouTube. The video is there. The video is just as powerful as, as the lyrics are. But then we see, we, we see, yo, exactly, yo MTV raps. And the crazy thing is, the crazy thing is, they used to, early in the day, back in the day, early on, they used to play. It, it was, wow, they, they used to play some of these videos. And I was, t I was telling Tim also that they learned a lesson. They learned a lesson that they have told themselves that they are not going to repeat. Just like when, it, when those folks decided to make that documentary about Malcolm, to try to dramatize Malcolm and the nation of Islam, and to try to make them and to have them you know, be the big black boogeymen, you know what I'm saying, to fear these black Muslims, fear these black Muslims, fear this black man. There was a documentary that was, named, that was made in the 50s called The Hate That Hate Produced. And they're very, really, really clever with the title, The Hate That Hate Produced. Not the community activism that hate produced. And we're talking about the hate. We're talking about white supremacist hate. We're talking about racist hate, vicious racist hate. Okay? Stuff was not easy for black folks in the 60s, if you didn't know that. But I think we all know that. So they say the hate that hate produced. Saying that this is a hate, and, and that title is, is, is saying this is a hate-filled organization. They hated white supremacy. They hated everything that came with white supremacy. They hated institutional racism. But they were, but they, but they learned a very, la very, uh, a very important lesson because when they put that documentary out, that was done on CBS, Mike Wallace and, and uh, um, Lomax. When they put that documentary out, yes, it drummed up some fear in a lot of white folks and and so-called mainstream America, but it also has turned, served as a great recruiting tool and also an empowerment tool for blacks who are in different parts of the city outside of New York that hadn't been exposed to Malcolm's words at that time. And they're saying, wow, he's saying everything I've been thinking. Or he's saying things that I haven't been thinking in, in ways that I never even thought about. Saying that, you remember Malcolm said, yo, if I put you at a table and you're, and you're at a table with, with 10 other people and they're eating, they got food on their plate and they're eating, and you have nothing on your plate, no food on your plate, are you a diner? He said, you can't be a diner unless you're feasting on food. So why would you, and he said, so why would you call yourself American until you are feasting on the same civil liberties and social justice that your white counterparts are getting? That's what he said. And he said it in a way and it, and it made an impact and a lot of black folks that start, went from calling themselves black to saying, yo, I'm African. I'm African. <laughs> Native tongues. We look at this part, of, even the part of the golden era. We look at the, the, the black medallions, no gold. Hey, you know, and, and so this is, you, you look at, um, you look at uh, um, uh, the likes of, of Tribe Called Quest and Queen Latifah and the Jungle Brothers. You know, these are all folks that were part of that, that whole clique called uh, the native tongues, but they wore the African medallions. And so, like I said, I wasn't some, some kind of wunderkind. <laughs> I, I, was, I, was, I wasn't necessarily, you know, just, uh, just develop these ideas on my own, but I, I was impressionable, just like kids are today. So I saw my favorite rappers wearing black medallions. They wore these black medallions. Attached with black rope and inside, encrusted in this leather medallion, was the map of Africa. So I looked at it, so we saw that, and I was one of probably scores and scores of, 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 student, uh, of young people nationwide that went out and bought these, went out on the street corner and bought it from a vendor and bought two and three of these medallions and wore them proudly to school. We're talking about 13, 14, 15 years of age. You couldn't tell me at 15 that there was something wrong with my, the color of my skin, or there's something wrong with me calling myself African, or me calling myself my, and saying I'm proud to be black. You couldn't tell me, because the rappers that I was listening to, that we were listening to, the ones that we were so impressionable were hanging on to every single word, like on the edge of a cliff, hanging on to their words, they were telling, they were instilling this in us. 
and stealing this on us when America was telling us the direct opposite. The direct opposite. You're no good because you're black. You're no good because you're African. Or you're, 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 you're inferior to your white counterparts. You're just innately inferior. Saying it with their words, their actions, and their subliminals. So this is, you, and no doubt, youth activism was on, was on the rise, 88, 90 to 93. The golden era name, the oh, name drop. All right, you guys have heard the name drop. You know, so today, like today in 2013, oftentimes the name drop is associated with a brand. And oftentimes those rappers, misguided rappers, if you will, um, will drop the names of, of different products owned by, you know, folks who want nothing to do with their communities, but are, are very, very happy for the free, for the free advertising they're getting in these songs. <laughs> well, they're very happy, you know, whether you're dropping Chris Dow, or you want to drop your Air Force, talk about your Air Force Ones, your Nikes, or your Rims, or this, that, and the other. They're very happy with the, with the, with, with the uh, free advertising and the free promotion they're getting. But they're not trying to build up your community in any shape, form, or fashion. No, not at all. But these are the kind of name drops that were commonly dropped in hip-hop songs and rap songs during the golden era. Marcus Garvey, Kwame Ture. Some of you may know him as, as Stokely Carmichael, but he died Kwame Ture. All right, study the man who was Stokely Carmichael, and study the man who was, who was uh, Kwame Ture. Looking at Kwame Nkrumah, as I said before, one of my heroes. He, he knew it. We got this. We got this in songs. So here we go. Now we start to make this transition. Now we're going to start making the transition to one of my, what I would say, probably the most important part of, of, of this talk. All right? And I want to I, I put it out there. If anything stimulates you during my talk, anything whatsoever, and you say, yo, I want to get involved, because you know what? I'm not, I'm not trying to mention any names. I'm not, I'm not trying to say, I'm not trying to, to, to call anybody out. But I know, I work on a college campus. I know how money is, is spent sometimes. I know how it's, so oftentimes, <clears throat> we'll spend $5,000, $10,000, sometimes even $20,000, right, Tim? to bring in speakers. They, they try to bring in these speakers, and these speakers oftentimes will, will just you know, give their lecture, and they're gone. They're gone. I, I look at it as, 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 a, as, a, as a point of departure to build with young people like yourselves, to get involved. So if anybody whatsoever wants to get involved with the media work that we do, the you can serve as a, as a community correspondent, as a student correspondent. You don't have to be physically in DC. You can be here. You can, we can patch you through the switchboard, you can help co-host shows, you can, if you have Skype, you can do it. We have a video show that we do over the internet. We just, Tim and I just did our last broadcast, we have over 3,000 views uh, worldwide from the, you know, and so we do, uh, we do a lot of inter interviews remotely, just interviewed a young brother from, from uh, South Africa, and he came on and was talking about police brutality there. So if you want to do any of this stuff, we have the technology to work it out. And so I brought my, my cards and, and a sign-up sheet, so if you want to get involved, Please do. Please do. So these are some of the issues that were discussed during the golden era. Police brutality. I mean, you, you see it. Yeah. These are some of the issues. And this is, this is also something important because a lot of us have been, some of our heroes and sheroes, have, yes, have been written out. As Chuck D said, most of my heroes don't appear on no stamp. But also, some of our heroes have been watered down because they don't want us to understand the most radical and revolutionary aspects of those heroes, such as Martin Luther King. They don't tell you about the last three, four years of this man's life and what made him persona non grata, hated by the U.S. government, where he was no longer invited into Lyndon Baines Johnson's White House because he was so outspoken against the military industrial complex. He was spoke, outspoken against uh, Euro-Americans' imperialist wars in, uh, war in Vietnam, all right? He, he, he called out capitalism for what it was and, and mentioned the triplets, all right? A very famous speech that you can, if you can, can't write it down, remember it because it's on YouTube. It's called Beyond Vietnam, Breaking the Silence, a speech that he gave a year to the day before he was killed, before he was assassinated, April 4th, 1967. And he mentions the three triplets that were plaguing America. Excessive materialism, he was talking about capitalism, the military-industrial complex, and yes, racism. But he said, a nation that continues to spend more money on military uh, defense than on programs of social uplift is heading for spiritual doom. And this was a man of the cloth. This was a, this was a church coin man. This was a pastor. This was the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. 
So yes, he chose his words wisely because he meant them. He said a, a, a nation that continues to spend more money on military, military programs than it does on, on, on social programs is headed for spiritual doom. What's changed? And he also referred to the U.S. as the greatest purveyor of violence on the face of the earth back in 1967 as well. What has changed in 2013? Very little, where you have a government who, who spends a trillion dollar plus dollars uh, the last several years on war and military and industrial complex, a thousand military bases throughout the world, but yet spends $77 billion, $75 billion on education. And right now, education, we have schools in Chicago, 50 schools are slated to be shut down. You have all that money, they don't need to be shut down. You have schools in D.C. Tim and I are doing work, activist work on the ground with a coalition of, of, of activists in D.C., Black is Back Coalition, where we're trying to stop these uh, 15 closings of these schools in D.C. right now. How many white students are affected by those uh, one, closings? One, 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 And in Chicago, 87% of the students that are affected by the 54 schools that are, that are slated to be shut, to closed down, 87% of them are black or Latino. 87% of them. So we had this kind of stuff in, in, um, that also was cultural education. This was Jungle Brothers who was, were part of the, the native tongues. Um, you see the words there. I want to kind of like run through it. Um, and it says right here at the bottom, until the lions tell the story of the hunt, uh, until the lions tell their tale, the story of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. But today, today, these same narratives are covered in hip hop. But you don't hear about them. They're covered by artists across the board. Artists that are black, white, Latino. But it's suppressed. You have artists like Brother Ali, you have, as I said before, Dead Prez, and we could go on and on. And they don't play him. I mean, most deaf, for God's sakes, who was one of the most popular, you know, underground MCs. They, they don't play his stuff. Okay? That is premeditated. They don't want folks, young folks, especially young folks of color, to be exposed to these narratives, to see the, what, at the, what is at the root of their oppression. They don't want to see the roots that are connected to poverty that is entrenched in their communities. They don't want them to see that. They don't want them to see the reason. They don't want them to see uh, the U.S. military as an imperialist force. They, want, they, don't want them to see, they don't want them to see any of that stuff. These artists are talking about these things. These artists are talking about the media. They're talking about the media and what the media does and, and how it manipula manipulates and suppresses information and all of this stuff, man. I, I, I mean, I could go on. Let me, let me just tell you one real thing real quick. Uh, one, let me put out one, 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 one number for you that, that's also been kept off your airwaves. When Dr. King was assassinated in 1968, for every dollar that a white person got, a black person got 54 cents. What do you think it is in 2013? Because th this post-racial era that we're supposed to be allegedly living in. You're, very, you're close. 57 cents. And you know what? In 2011, it was 60, so it's actually gone down 3 cents. Where did you get that statistic? That's, that statistic? United for a Fair Economy. It's, a, it's an economic think tank based out of Boston. I'm sorry, could you repeat I'm not, that? Yeah. United? Uh-huh. What was that? United, United for a Fair Economy. That statistic is... United for a Fair Economy, every, every year they do an extensive report called um, 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 Something of the Dream, and it's very extensive. So just Google United for a Fair Economy, United for a Fair Economy. And also one more thing, for every dollar of wealth, every dollar of wealth that a, a, a white household has, a black household has roughly about five to seven cents of wealth. Yeah, so, so we've come a long way. This is a post-racist society, right? No, it's not. So, and, and the folks that are pulling me, just, just bear with me for a second. We're going to get to the questions. All right, just we're going to get to the questions. Um, so here we have, and I, and I just want to put something out here real quick. We were talking before when I was in the office. We were talking about a, a man by the name of Joseph Gorbals. The propaganda. You guys have heard of Little Brother? You've heard of Little Brother? Maybe, perhaps. Well, all right, maybe, perhaps. Well, all right, well. Yeah, they're, they're a group from North Carolina, but when, when asked, when a BET executive at the time was asked, you've heard about this, yeah, when it was asked, why don't you play more, more videos from socially conscious rappers, I mean, they basically said, paraphrase them, um, it's not that we don't think 
that they're talented, we just think their lyrics are too intelligent for the BET audience. Mm -hmm. And that's, that itself is even a lie. Yes, yes, my man, I like that reaction right there. Yes, that's what they said. But that's even a lie itself. It's not even that they, don't, they, they think it's too intelligent for you, it's that they don't want you to hear the information that's being put out there. And so, this is, gosh, this is, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll table this, but this is a book that was written by somebody by the name of Ed Bernays. It was called Propaganda. And he wrote the book not for the Nazis, but the book was so effective. He wrote it, he was the nephew of Sigmund Freud, but he wrote it, um, and it was published in 1928. And it was so, it was, it was such a, a powerful book that the Nazis' main propagandist, Joseph Goebbels, used that book as a Nazi playbook to get most, to get most of the Germans to be complicit with what was going on, what they were doing to, to, to Jews, to gay folks, to political dissenters, and so forth. So, um, and, it, and it basically says right here, we are dominated by the relatively small numbers of persons who, are, who understand the mental processes and social patterns of the masses. They control the wires. I mean, they, they pull the wires that control the public mind. Very, very important. Nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. This is stuff that's been going on for decades and decades. Walter Lippmann, somebody else that I wouldn't have dinner with, but you have to read the books that they don't expect you to read. You have to read the books of your foes as well. And this, in, this individual saw the American hoi polloi, the masses, as the bewildered herd, that we must keep news and information from them, certain news and information from them, because we must control them. We must give them what they can handle, right? They wanted to continue to control the masses politically. As we start to come to the close, 1989, rappers are talking about media literacy. Kumo D is saying, I won't believe the hype. I, I understand the media dictates the mind and rotates the way you think and syncopates at slow pace. He says, I won't believe the media hype. This is 1989. I'm getting this, as I said before, at age 12 and 13. And this is, one of, this is not a fringe song. This is a song that was played over and over again. So when the song first came out, we would be listening to the song seven, eight, nine times a day, over and over again, in our single cassette. You must understand this. This is really, really important. You must under question everything. The great professors on this campus will tell you to question everything. Because if you don't, if you don't, and this is from KRS-One, and we know who KRS-One is, knowledge reigns supreme over nearly everyone. And so he says, if you don't, know the history of the author, then you don't know what you're reading. If you don't know the history of the author, if you come out from, from, from Mars and you read My Struggle, Mein Kampf from, from, uh, from Adolf Hitler, and you read it, which I have, you'll come away have, like, man, like, it, it, you won't see the book for what it is because you don't have any background of, of who the author is. So this right here, you guys can Google this, this right here, martinlutherking.org, if you go to it, You'll read some very slanderous things about Martin Luther King. You're like, what? what? the hell's going on? What's, what's going on? And then when you find out, when I did further research, re research this website is being, con is being controlled by Stormfront, which is a neo-Nazi group based, uh, based out of the South. And so they put all this slanderous stuff about Martin Luther King there. It's being controlled by a very white supremacist, uber-racist, neo-Nazi uh, group. So... Clear Channel, as we come to the close and your questions, Clear Channel, largest, this is everything to do with hip-hop. I'm, listen, I'm trying to tell you, this has everything to do with hip-hop. So sorry I'm not talking about 50 or Trinidad James as much as you maybe want, you know what I'm saying? I don't have anything nice to say about them, but I'm, but I, I'm gonna let you know, this has everything to do with hip-hop because these corporations like Clear Channel is the largest radio corporation in America. They own over 1,200 radio stations brought on by the Telecom Act of 1996, a whole other story. But this is their founder, their founder and former CEO, Lowry Mays. He said, we're not in the, and, and many of those radio stations, not all, but many of those radio stations are considered urban R&B hip hop stations. And you won't find any of the stuff that I've been talking about in terms of hip hop on those stations. They suppress all that stuff. So they put all the step and fetch it, coon stuff out there, stuff that, with, coon, C-O-O-N, the stuff, the coonery. You heard, you heard the tune. Coonery. So he says, he says, we're not interested. We're not in the business of providing news and information. We're not in the business of providing well-researched music. 
We're simply in the business of selling our customers products. Yes. He's not beholden to you. Yes. He's beholden to his customers' products. And how do radio stations and television stations make their money? They make it through commercials, ad time. Yes. These images, what do these images invoke to you? Yes. Coonery, you say coonery, are they racist? Yes. yes, they're very racist. And when they can't get a black person to carry out the shucking and jiving that they want, they get Al Jolson, a white person, to put on that black face. But we can see this. We say, yo, this is racist, man. Look at this. None of y'all would accept this, right? None of y'all accept this. But very prevalent in the 20s and 30s. These people were around that time, the 20s, 30s, and beyond. But they weren't used, they didn't use them to sell products. They didn't say, hey, Mr. W.E.B. Du Bois, Mr. Marcus Garvey, can you come on? Can you, can you, uh, can, would you be willing to appear on, on this soapbox and help sell this product? No, no, because these images carry on the negative racist stereotype of black people. These don't. These people are complete, are, are complete antithetical to that. They are complete opposite. And these folks resist white supremacy and institutional racism every step of the way. But here, how is this different than this? Mm -hmm. Professor Sadiq, how is this different from this? How is it? How is it? These are some of the images that are out there. So yes, the aforementioned Trinidad James. We have this, and here, and listen, I am a non-violent person unless it is for self-defense. So I want to preface that, but I want to tell you this that this image would not have been made popular, it would not have been on, on, on you know, in magazines and so forth, and been pushed by Universal, um, it would not have been pushed if they, if, listen, if they knew, if, if, if the implication that on the other end of that was a white person, that he was pointing at a white person. No. The implication we know, we expect the gun to be pointed at somebody that looks just like 50, somebody that looks just like me, somebody that looks just like your student body president. That's the implication. We understand that. So these are popular. So why don't we see these as racist as these? The reason why is because they have been popularized. That they've been popularized and forced down your throat and, and beat into your subconscious day in and day out where you just begin to accept them and as Cara G. Woodson says, start to control your mind and therefore start to control how you see yourself and how you see others. serious this is. You see this right, this is a song from 2010 and, and there's a website, I'm, let, I'm giving you the information. You can go to Urban Insight. You can go to Urban Insight and you can find out how many times the, some of the most popular songs in hip-hop and R&B are played week in, week out. So for instance, this song, I'll just give you, give you, you know, just jump into it, alright? Strap, okay, jeez. And it's, and it's, <laughs> Yeah. Many times have I done this, man. Strapped up, shawty. You know my nerves bad. Trigger like toothpick line wrapped around the corner. Boy, too big. G code. Black shades and my black chains. But if you wouldn't understand, it's a black thing. You know we drink rose, alcohol, till we black out, wake up, drink some more, and pass out. Yeah. So this is the acceptable form of blackness that they're willing to put out there. Exhibit A. This song. In one week's period of time, from May 15th to May 21st in 2010, was played nationally. When you take the aggregate, aggregate number of how many times it was played on radio stations nationally, was 2,600 times, 2,605 times. And that equated to, it meant that it reached 17,161,000 different people. At the same time, so we move back, we look at the birthday song. And if, if you not just are a woman, but if you are an anti-sexist, anti-misogynist, which I would hope every single man in this room would be, 
this song is unacceptable. So, you know, it's showing, you know, bad bitch contest, it's your birthday. I won't die, bury me inside the booty club, get it girl. I mean, you've seen the video, you've seen the video. If you haven't seen the video for the song, YouTube it and you'll see, you'll see what I'm talking about. Talked about gold, everything. And we look at this, we look at this song. I won't read the, the I won't read the, uh, the, the lyrics, but this song reached, and, and this, this was not in its apex, just, just, a couple weeks ago, just a couple weeks ago, this song was still reaching close to 10 million people. 10 million people on a weekly basis. This kind of music, this music, these are artists that are out now, and this is just a snapshot. I told you before, I would say at least 80% of the hip hop music that comes out of the US is not played on mainstream airwaves, the vast majority of it. These are artists that are out right now. You're talking about the Dead Press, M1 and Stickman. You're talking about Bahama Diaz. We have a lot of folks from Philly. She's from Philly. She's not scantily clad. You see, um, you see an old picture of Queen Latifah, and you see the backdrop. She has the, the Africa, all hail the queen, saying, I am a queen. I'm not a bitch. I'm not a hoe. I am a queen. I am a queen. All right? Mortal Technique, Dark Sun Riders. But these, do, are any of them carrying guns? So why would they be seen as discomforting? They are seen as discomforting because they buck and they reject and resist the stereotypical image that is put out there about black and brown people. These are, these are the name drops that are dropped now. The Rolex, the Moet, the Diamonds. Dead Press. At the same time that that song I was playing before, that applies the, in Young Jeezy, that Young Jeezy song, at the same time when that song's out, this song was out, but was never played on any corporate mainstream airwaves. And this is Dead Press. This, 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 just look at this. This is why it's all in the pudding right now. Look at it. They mobilize the marches of the movement and imprison many people. They modern the music. They make it Mars out of you and me. The emblem is a panther, not a pimp. And my woman is an empress. If you ever get a glimpse, say my woman is an empress, not a bee, not a hoe. She is an empress. My impression of a moron is empty-minded man. This is their range of ownership. And I want to let you know, if you take all the radio stations in this country, black people own 3.4% of all the radio stations in this country. Let's take all the people of color that identify with being people of color in this country, and they own 7.8% of all the radio stations. Let's take all the TV stations in this country. Black people own 0.6% of all the TV stations. Put all the people of color together, and collectively we own 3.4% of, of all the TV stations. We are not controlling the airwaves. Therefore, we are not. So yes, there's a pertinent person, certain amount of responsibility that goes on these rappers, but you have to understand, these rappers, a lot of them are young bucks who have been trained on the same music that they're putting out right now, that they're propagating. So if someone's in a community, we talk about, and there's a drug, a, a, a drug situation in somebody's community, we're talking about if you want to get the drugs out of the community, you got to get to the kingpin, the big drug dealer, eventually, right? So what we don't do with that with the media. We don't ever talk about, we give them a pass. We don't talk about Sumner Redstone, owner of Viacom. We don't talk about the people that are peddling psychological opiates, psychological drugs. <coughs> It's in video games, we go on and on, we've learned about hip hop, and this is like the second to last slide. We've learned about hip hop, we know what it is right now, all of you know what it is. You know the, 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 the elements, you know the principles, but young, young kids that even play video games. I took this right here, I took this right, right here, and I blew it up, and I put it down here. So this is the back of a video game that was really popular a couple years ago, called Jeff Jam's Icon. And so right here, this is what they take, right? And this is how they go and they feed it. They feed it to young people, all right? And they recreate hip hop and make it into a Frankenstein thing that, that disproportionately impacts young people of color. That Chicago, uh, EA Chicago is delivering a, stun, stone, uh, a star stunning action, bone breaking beats as players live out the life of hip hop mogul, going from rags to riches, incorporating hip hop culture in every aspect of the game. Death and Icon will deliver the intensity of a no holds barred street fight with style and rhythm. They're telling you we're putting violence to rhythm. We're putting violence to rhythm. That's what we're putting it to. We're not, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna put anything in, in hip hop in this game that, that portrays peace, love, you, and having fun. We're not gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk, we're gonna say that we're gonna put violence to rhythm and you're gonna eat it up 
like the rats listen to the Pied Piper and follow him along. Music will affect how players fight. Not how players come here and, and say, what's going on, Karamba? What's going on, brother? In each venue, uh, environmental actions and, and, and hazards be the strategy. So the strategy to say is to, the strategy they're saying to staying alive is to fight your way to the top, not to come together and to build our community together. That's what they're telling you. That's how deep it is. BET had a show, has a show called American Gangster. And so they don't tell you, they don't say, if they cared about you, they would say, hey, you know what? We're gonna, we're gonna, have, we're gonna have a show that's gonna talk about Imhotep, and that's gonna talk about Nkrumah, and talk about Ida B. Wells, and Fannie Lou Hamer, and Queen Anne Zingo, we go on and on. No, we're gonna have a show, and we're gonna highlight gangsters every week. Week in, week out. And you know what? All the gangsters look like you or me. They don't look like George Bush or Dick Cheney. Real gangsters. Real gangsters like George Bush and Dick Cheney. Yeah. These are young men and women who have been slaughtered through police brutality. And there are songs that talk about this. This is Ayanna Stanley Jones, a seven-year-old black girl. In 2010, she was shot in her home as she lay on her couch. The bullet went through her, the, um, went through her neck and, and, her, and her head, and she was killed. And you know what? She was on the cover of Time magazine. The nation didn't know about it. It wasn't a, it wasn't a national outcry. You know what? Because they suppressed that. She was unarmed. And no one in their house was the person they were looking through. They just busted that, oops, wrong house. And they just started shooting and shot her, killed her. We know Trayvon Martin. We know Sean Bell, uh, Timothy Stansberg. And we know virtually every community, whether it's Cincinnati or Cleveland, Ohio, we know that police brutality is played there. And Dr. King said, "Justice, in, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And so as we end, it's dead press that says, I live, I die, a revolution, everything I do, I re revolutionize. I build what's good for the so whole damn hood. Study G's like these, I really think you should. I study Malcolm Garvey Huey. Malcolm X, Huey P. Newton, Marcus Garvey. I study Mark, Malcolm Garvey Huey. Malcolm X, Marcus Garvey, Huey P. Newton. I'm just, I ain't hating, I'm just saying, if you want to be a rapper, Study Malcolm, Malcolm Garvey Huey. What do you think if that song was played on regular rotation and little shorties around the way heard that song day in and day out? I want to be like Malcolm. I want to be like Martin. I want to be like Garvey. I want to be like Huey P. Newton, community organizer. I want to do all that stuff. I want to build up my community. I want to build it up. That's why they don't play it. Because he's saying, if you want to be a rapper, study Malcolm Garvey Huey. And that's why it's not given, it's not given to you in large doses anywhere or even small doses. You need to deconstruct every dominant narrative that is fed to you, everything. Even the information I've given to you, take it home, go back to your dorm rooms, read it, research it, and then after you read it and research it, start to give it to other people. Because there's a lot of students at Lincoln University and beyond that couldn't be here or just decided not to be here tonight. Take that information and you give it to them. You give it to them. Don't keep it for yourself. You don't read for yourself. You read for other people to give and disseminate that information. And it's each one, not teach one, each one teach ten. I want to thank you all for your time. Perhaps we'll also put it on the radio. So I want to thank him and ask for your questions. And also, um, what each one of you to think through what's happening to this great country that our women, our sisters are being demeaned, insulted, abused, raped, and many times killed. And our young men either being killed or put in prison. And then they say, these people, they don't work. We have to come out of Lincoln, finding a job, and the jobs have gone to some so I want to really thank him for taking the trouble. He's a friend of Lincoln, that's why he's here. I'll open it up for him to ask questions. You can feel the question. Um, right there. Um, look, um, Byron Hurd, he's a, uh, not a famous, but he's I use his, move, his uh, documentary in my class, right, one of my classes. He's a documentary like speaking one of our classes. He said that there's a difference between mainstream, mainstream hip hop and Conscious hip hop, the two different genres. That's the two different genres of music. Do you right. agree with that? With yeah, I, I, yeah, I call it a corporate hip hop. 
because it's the, these large corporations that, that are behind it. And in 1996, there was something called the Telecom Act um, of 1996, which it shows you, I just because a lot of us have been programmed to think that like Democrats are our buddies and so forth, and it was like Malcolm that was telling us, like saying that your political chumps, like so he was talking, I mean, he was very forthright, but he was talking very affectionately to the black community, saying your political chumps, if you believe, Democrats are wolves in sheep clothing. You know what I'm saying? They're, they're not much different. They're going to come to your community, you know, four, six, seven, eight months before the election, and they're going to leave. And so, um, but the Telecom Act, I say that because the Telecom Act was, was pushed by a Republican, um, was pushed very hard by a Republican Senate, um, by the likes of Newt Gingrich, and then it was hand-delivered to uh, Bill Clinton, uh, who was, you know, gets a free pass for being some kind of progressive uh, president, which he wasn't. Um, and uh, he signed it. He signed it, you know, and this, this is like just one of the smallest things that he did. But he signed it. So I want to give you an, an, an example. Once that Telecom Act was signed in 1996, it's, and it's not like black people owned a whole bunch of radio stations before that, but they owned a lot more than they did before the Telecom Act. After the Telecom Act of 1996, black ownership of radio decreased 70%. 70%. Wow. Because, it, it, because what, it, what it did was, before there was regulation, there was caps. So, so if, if, if Winnie owned a radio station um, uh, corporation, or she owned, yeah, she owned a company and she wanted to own radio stations, like the most that she could own would, would be 20, you know, 20 AM, 20 FM. There would be a cap at 40, 20 AM and 20 FM. After that, the, the sign of the Telecom Act was completely deregulated and just it was a free fall. And it allowed those that had the most money to go in and to buy out radio stations. And if you wanted to hold on to your radio station, if you were a, a, a community radio station, they would, they would drown you out because now you wouldn't get any, any ad time. Because people were like, oh, we're going to go to this big one that has this 50,000 watt or 100,000 watt tower. And, you know, and, and we're going to drown you out. And so it, it decreased 80%. They just could it was untenable. They couldn't survive. And so it, it decreased. And, and one piece of, uh, and so I would, I, would, I would agree, I would largely agree with what he said. I would just call it corporate rap. And I just want to, part of your history is the end, if you guys were obviously know way, you guys are well schooled about reconstruction. So from the, from the start of reconstruction, the start of Reconstruction to the start of the 1900s, right? Black people in the U.S. from coast to coast owned less, no less than 200 newspapers, from the California Eagle to the Amsterdam News, and everything in between. 200. And why did they do that? They did that because white America wasn't telling their stories. They weren't telling the stories. And white America, the white papers were demonizing and putting out racial, racially uh, stereotypical images of black people. And so they said, we must, we must tell our own story. So it, this is rich in our history. Kwame Nkrumah, you know what I'm saying, you know, um, started newspapers. I mean, one was a Pan-Africanist. I mean, you know, uh, Marcus Garvey um, had newspapers, magazines. One of the most well-known was the Negro World. So this is part of our history. So what I see myself doing is I, I wanted to reach back and I said, you know what, I don't have a lot of economic wherewithal, but I can use the, the re little resources I have to start my own media outlet. And I, and I want to bring in young people as correspondents. And Tim will tell you, I have a lot of young people that are correspondents. I've had high school kids from Baltimore City that have come on and talk about hip hop and how it impacted. But this young man from Baltimore that I, was that I was talking about, he came on my 17 years of age, came on my show and was breaking down. He said, all they show is, is stereotypical stuff about us. That's all they flush, try to flush down our, our, you know, and he was attacking the local radio station in, in Baltimore, the Q. So there's a lot of young people that have some really important things to say about their, themselves, about their community. And, and so, I, you know, I see it as an opportunity to, to get these stories and news and information. So, yeah, thank you for that question. A very famous person said one time, Malcolm X said, no one, it, it's foolish to get on people that don't know something for the first time. Everyone didn't know something for the first time. This information, I didn't know for the first time. I didn't know this information. I didn't walk, I wasn't born into this information. But when I got it, I had the opportunity to, hey, I'm going to run, take it and run with it. So I think people have need to be given the opportunity to be, to be presented with this information. If it's not being presented in schools, then it's our job to present it to people. Now, if they run away from it and say, I don't want that information anymore, uh, then that's, that's their prerogative. But we must give them the opportunity. We must be collective and communal about it. If anyone wants to, to build with me, I have my card, has my direct cell phone number. 
and because I prefer actually you can just get on the horn and, 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 and call me. Um, I have a lot of information, you know, that I have on my website that I get you, um, um, you know, MCs that are being suppressed. So if you're like, you know, where, where is this, where is this alternative hip hop that you're talking about? I have that. I have tons of information in terms of alternative websites that you need to be getting news and information because he's right. Like, you know, corporations, they, they, they don't. But when these corporate, they, they saw an opening. They said, okay, yeah, we care about our bottom line. But at the same time, if we can make a whole bunch of money, a whole bunch of money, um, and it's a billion dollar industry now, a whole bunch of money at the same time, making sure that we suppress this music, this kind of music right now, and making sure that we promote. Because at the time, you know, there were some gangster rap artists that had come out and they said, listen, this is going to be the cookie cutter. This is what we're going to use. We're going to promote this. We're going to suppress this. And I've interviewed MCs, like well-known MCs. There, and there's MCs I haven't interviewed that have been out, in the, that have been out giving speeches and, and talks and so forth. And they've talked about how they just went from a gold album, and then they're, all of a sudden their record label says, yo, we're not going to, we're not going to promote you anymore. And then in place of them, they promoted like a gangster rap group or this, that, and the other. So it was also about making sure that they carried on a certain image because of the, because think about it. They, they could have easily said, you know, we're going to make a lot of money, tens and tens and hundreds of millions of dollars while promoting these positive messages. No, they said we're going to make a lot of money, but we're going to promote the most mentally damaging, psychologically deleterious messages and images of of black and brown people. So my, my, my closing comment, um, and, and I'll tell you, growing up there was also some white groups too that were, that were doing their thing, like Third Base was a, a white group out of Brooklyn. And they, they were talking about apartheid, they had a song called There Is No Master Race, and their whole song, they were attacking the notion of white supremacy. These were white MCs and a, and a black DJ from, um, from Jamaica, but two white MCs, Pete Nice and, and uh, MC Search, and, and uh, uh, Richie Rich was their DJ. So it, it was touching people, and it, and it was it was a movement. That's what hip hop is. It's it's a it's a movement, and you and if you use, as I said before, music has always been used with any social revolution. It's always been used by youth. And so, as I close, corporations. It's the same corporation. Think about it. Corporations, and not all corporations are vile, but I would say the vast majority of them are. They have they have very very bad intentions, and they have little to no scruples. Remember, it was IBM, but IBM was, while, while they knew that Hitler and the Nazis were, were gassing people, they said, you know, we can make some money. So they sold the punch card technology to the Nazis so that the Nazis could categorize and place in rubrics who was being gassed and who was slated to be gassed and so forth. It was Coca-Cola that sold a bunch of soda to the Nazis. They sold Fanta. Fanta is owned by Coca-Cola. It's a subsidiary of Coca-Cola. So they had no qualms selling it to the Nazis. All right, this is the story of corporations. A great movie about corporations is called The Corporation, and it's free on Google Video and on, on YouTube. It's just called The Corporation. Watch it. So my, my message to you in, in, in closing is to make sure that you deconstruct everything and put yourself in the driver's seat. Put yourself in the driver's seat to see yourself as an agent of social change. And I, I know it sounds cliche and it may sound corny, but you must put yourself in that position to say, listen, I can impact, even if it's four or five people. That's a major difference because one of those four or five people in your circle that you impact, that you light, light, a, light a, ignite some kind of fire in their mind, that could be somebody that has a much greater opportunity to, to galvanize hordes and hordes of people. So you must take that responsibility, and you don't have to, to, to put off your career aspirations to become a social activist. It means just getting involved, being simply engaged in your, in, in, in your community, whatever community that you're in. Finding a way, whether it's mentoring, mentoring a, young people, a young person and not watering down, giving them not just inf news and information that they don't get, regardless of what background they, they, they're in, but teaching them how to deconstruct, how to critically think, not what to think, but how to critically think. That's, that's a very underutilized skill, how to critically think. And I want you to, to think of the world, and this is the last thing, that last thing I want you to say, is to think of yourself as a citizen of the globe, as a world citizen. Yes, you have geopolitical citizenship here in the U.S. where you are voting, you can vote, and this, that, and the other. But see yourself, if we look at ourselves as neighbors of people in Pakistan, where Professor Sadiq is from, or we see ourselves with brothers and sisters 
with young Abdul Muhammad, who is in Afghanistan right now, then we get outraged the same way we got outraged when we, when we heard about what happened to Trayvon Martin. The same way some of you got outraged when you heard about what happened to Ayanna Stanley Jones. Because I want to tell you right now, there is something called drone wars going on right now. And the U.S. is launching drone attacks on innocent civilians. Innocent civilians throughout this world with no regard. So they'll say, okay, yeah, we want to get a so-called terrorist. There are two terrorists in, in this, this community in northwest Pakistan, in, in, in Warzikstan. We, there's two people there. They'll bomb the whole community to get those two people and take out 20, 40, 50, 60 at one time. They're, they are living under hell right now. They are living under hell. So I was going to mention to you Malcolm X, Fannie Lou Hamer. They spoke out against U.S. imperialism. If we are going to create a better world, it starts with us that live right inside this empire speaking out and making a difference and saying we're not going to accept it. Whether it is a white face in George Bush or a black face or brown face in Barack Obama, Barack Obama has, has executed more drone attacks in his first year in presidency than George Bush did in his entire eight years. And Stanford University in New York, the New York University did a study and they found that 98%, 98% of the people that have been killed in these drone attacks have been innocent civilians. So if you were shedding tears about those kids, as well you should have, in Newtown, Connecticut, as we should have, it should have touched all of us, then why don't you shed tears for the 178 plus children who have been killed in Pakistan alone, in one country alone, children under the age of 16 by way of drone attacks. I'm not smiling. This is nothing to laugh about. And it's the privileged world that we live in, even if you're from inner city Philadelphia, what have you, it's the privileged world that we, that we live in that we can smile about, about these things and laugh them off. But imagine that if your community was under terror of, of some, country, some other country, whether it's Britain or Canada or some other country, raining drone missiles into your community and you didn't know where you could or could not walk. That's what hip hop helped do for me. Expose me and to expose me to these narratives and to see the world as a, as a vast place and to see myself as, as a brother of, of people, whether they're Muslim, whether they're Arab, whether they regardless whether they're from Afghanistan or Somalia or what have you. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And Malcolm X said, I will let him have the last word. He said, yes, that Malcolm X, who was that black nationalist, but as you know, when he came back from Mecca, he saw the world, and he, and he saw the world in a slightly different way. And he said, I'm against injustice no matter what the person looks like. No matter what the person looks like. And that yes, that includes whether a person is brown or black or me. If I'm, if I'm carrying out injustices, you need to be against Solomon Kamalshan. If I'm not, then you need to be with me. We need to build together. So I hope that some of you guys may reach out to me. But I want to thank you so much for your time. And thank you.